high availability networks. So when we talk about high availability, we are measuring our availability based on the uptime. How often is the computer up and running ready for us to use it, or the network in this case? When we talk about it, we usually talk about what's called the five nines of availability, which we mentioned before. And that is 99.999% availability is what we're aiming for. That means we have a maximum of five minutes of downtime per year. That's pretty hard to do. I mean, if you just do a weekly reboot, you're going to bust through that five minutes per year. So in that case, we need to come up with options that will keep these networks up, available, and reliable all year round. Our availability is concerned with being up and operational at all times. Our reliability is concerned with not dropping packets. So if we have a very high availability network that's up all the time, but it's dropping packets a lot, it can be highly available, but not very reliable. Conversely, we can have a network that is not dropping any packets and it's fully reliable, but if it's down half the year, it's not very available. So we got to concern ourselves with both of those and try to keep both of them up and running as best we can. When we look at the reliability of devices, we have a couple of different metrics that we use. So if I'm going to go and purchase a new router, for instance, I might want to know what the mean time to repair is. That's the average time it takes to repair a particular network device when it breaks. So if my router breaks and the power supply dies, how long will it take me to get another one and get it back up? The other measurement we look at is the mean time between failures, and that's the average time that we have between the failures of the devices. So if I have a given Cisco router, how long will it be between the time that the power supply dies? And there are statistics out there for this, so when you go to buy this stuff, you can talk with your Cisco rep or your Juniper or Brocade or whoever your network device is and find out what is their mean time between failures. Consumer-grade electronics tend to fail a lot quicker than, than prosumer or professional grade. So if I have a little Linksys router at my house, I can expect that to fail probably every year or every two years. When I have a Cisco you know, professional level router, I would expect that thing to be running for three to five years without issues. Um, and those are the kind of things I'm looking for. And I need to know how often parts are going to fail, how, often I, how long it's going to take for me to get back up, because all of those things are going to cause problems for us. When we look at the mean time between failure, if it goes up, the reliability of our network goes down. When we look at reliable devices, we want devices that are going to be up and operational as much as possible. And if you have highly reliable devices, you're going to have a highly available network. As you can see here in the graphic, we have the time that we show with our system failure. The time it takes to repair, that is our mean time to repair. The time between the time we fix it and the time it breaks again, that becomes our time of failure. So if we add all that from failure to failure, that is the time between failures. That's just a graphical representation of what we're talking about with the MTTR and the MTBF. We have two different ways of doing a fault-tolerant network design. One is that we can make the redundant network with single points of failure. So in this example, we have the two clients, we have two switches, and one router. We only have one path from the client to the other client, going through those switches and through that router. So if one of those devices dies, uh, and completely dies because both power supplies go away, we would end up losing connectivity. The particular fault tolerance here that we have, though, is that we have redundant connections. So we have two links between the routers and the switches, and we also have internal hardware redundancy with two power supplies. So hopefully, that internal redundancy will be enough to keep our network up and running. The second way we can do things is by buying additional hardware, and this will give us a redundant network with no single points of failure. Notice, if any one switch or any one router goes away, we can still communicate perfectly fine between host 1 and host 2. We do have link redundancy here between the switches and the routers, and each one is connecting a switch to both routers and both routers to both switches. We also have component redundancy, that we have redundant switches and redundant routers, giving us a fully functional network with no single points of failure. Hardware redundancy. So when we look at hardware redundancy, it can take many different forms. It can be having two network cards in a device, or having two power supplies in a device. And often when you have strategic network devices, you're going to find this dual redundancy going on. Things like routers, switches, firewalls, and servers, we usually have dual power supplies. Most of those devices, we're going to have dual network cards as well. If I'm dealing with somebody's client, their regular old workstation that they're working on, you're not going to normally find dual power supplies, and you're normally not going to find dual network cards. And the reason is it just adds to the overall cost and administrative overhead for most people. We have, when we deal with redundancy, we have either two ways of setting it up. We have active-active or active standby. If we do it as active-active, both network cards or both power supplies are active at the same time. They're both operating. Each of those network cards will have its own MAC address, and if one goes down, it's harder to determine that and to troubleshoot it. 
When you deal with active standby, you kind of think of this as like a primary and a backup. You have the primary one that's going to be operating, and when it goes down, the backup takes over. So it would be seamless transitioning, your network stays up. The clients only look like they have a single MAC address, and so they're only identifying the network by one hardware address, and it makes it easier to maintain and troubleshoot. As you can see here in the picture, we have normal operation on the, le on the left and the uh, after failover on the right. Normally, we're sending the data to the first unit. When it goes down, it automatically switches over to the st second unit. That's our active standby mode. And in the bottom picture here is a picture of a professional grade uh, router. And in this, we have dual redundant power supplies that you can see here with our dual power supplies coming out. Layer 3 redundancy. So another way that we can do things is we can do redundancy at our layer 3, which is how we route our traffic. Our clients are configured with a default gateway, which is a router. If that default gateway goes down, they won't be able to get out of the subnet. So instead, we use things like HSRP, the hot standby router protocol, to allow us to address a virtual router, and that way it would go to our active or standby routers. We talked about that earlier when we talked about routing. We also have other ones out there. Besides HSRP, we have Common Address Res Redundancy Protocol, which is CARP. We have our Virtual Router Redundancy Protocol, VRRP. We have our Gateway Load Balancing Protocol, GLBP. And we have our Link Aggregation Control Protocol uh, that we can use as well. All of these are different ways to overcome Layer 3 redundancy. First one is HSRP, which is our Hot Standby Routing Protocol. We've talked about this one before. Essentially, we, we have our client set up with a next hop gateway of a virtual router. Based on who's active, they will answer up that message. So in this case, the router on the left is active. When I make the request to 172.16.1.3, the left router is going to take that request. If the left router went down, instead it would go to the right. This allows my clients to stay online even if, the router go, if one of the two routers goes offline. This is a first hop redundancy protocol developed by Cisco. It's proprietary, so it's only found in Cisco devices. It allows the active and standby router configuration and creates that virtual router for us. Common address redundancy protocol is an open standard, so it's an open way of doing HSRP. So if you have a non-Cisco device, this can be used by everybody. It allows for that active standby again, and it still creates that virtual router. Same thing we were just looking at. The only difference here is that we have this open standard instead of a Cisco proprietary standard, just like HSRP. Our third one is the virtual router redundancy protocol which is another open standard and it operates again like HSRP. It was developed by the IETF, which is the um, Internet uh, Engagement Task Force, uh, Internet Engineering Task Force, excuse me. Uh, it does allow again for that active router, standby router configuration and creates that virtual router as the default gateway. All three of these operate extremely similarly. It's just whether or not it was Cisco developed, open source developed, or IETF developed. Next one we have here is GLBP, which is our Gateway Load Balancing Protocol. It's another first hop redundancy protocol. It was again developed by Cisco, so it is proprietary. It allows for active standby and creates a virtual router as the default. Um, this one with the Gateway Load Balancing, it is usually uh, used as your, your uh, first hop as well, similar to H HSRP. It's another way of doing things here. And the last one we have is our LACP, which is our Link Aggregation Control Protocol. We talked about this back in switching, where we actually will take all those ports and we'll aggregate them together to give us more bandwidth between devices. We get redundancy here because if one of those links goes down, in this example we have three, if say uh, port 1.2 went down, we would only lose one of the three links, and so our bandwidth might go from 300 megabits per second down to 200 megabits per second. It'll be a little slower, but it will still work. This allows us to do load balancing as well and also gives us redundancy. All those links will appear as a single logical link. So when we are designing our networks for high availability, we have to think of some questions. We have to think about where will the module and chassis redundancy be? Are we going to do this based on parts having dual power supplies or dual network cards? Or are we going to have dual chassis, meaning we're going to have two separate switches? That will cost more money, but usually it will give you a lot more of, of redundancy and availability. What software redundancy features are available? Can we use something like HSRP to be able to use two routers at the same time? What protocol characteristics will affect our design requirements? Do I want to use HSRP or do I want to use something that's more open source? Uh, we can have that choice as well. What redundancy features will be, will be used for powering the infrastructure device? Am I going to have dual power supplies? Am I going to put it on a battery backup? 
am I going to have a backup for the backup? So if the battery backup comes on, that's only going to last usually 5 to 15 minutes. Are we then going to switch over to a generator for power? These are the redundancy features when we're dealing with high availability networks we have to consider. And lastly, how are we going to do redundancy for our environmental controls? Are we going to have two air conditioning systems servicing that room? Because if the air conditioning goes down, your equipment's going to overheat and it's going to have to shut down as well. So these are all different things we have, to, we have to consider. There's no exact right answers. It's all about what money you have and what requirements you have. Because if we wanted to have the most available system and the mo most redundant system, we would have two of everything. But that would cost us double the amount of money. Not all, not all of our organizations can afford that. So we have to make those choices. So some best practices. Examine your technical goals. Again, money is finite, right? Second thing, identify your budget to fund the high availability features. It's easier to identify this stuff up front and build to a budget than it is to try to go afterwards and add all this high availability in later. Characterize your business applications into profiles because each profile has a certain level of availability. For instance, credit card processing may not be the most important thing in your business, but if you're American Express, that's what you make your money off of. And so for them, high availability in their credit card processing unit is much more important than having high availability in their sales unit. I would assume. Uh, if you look at a normal company, you can usually take those credit cards and batch process them later. So for them, making the sale up front might be more important and processing later would not be. And so you have those different things that pull at your business. You have to decide in your business what needs the highest availability and make those determinations. You also want to establish performance standards for your high availability solutions. If you don't have a standard, how are you going to measure if you're successful or not? So again, we use that 99.999% overall availability. But maybe for this particular workstation, I don't need that high of an availability. For my average consumer, I can be down, I don't know, 90, I can be up 90% of the time, and they'll be happy. But again, for the overall business, we need a 99.9% .9 uptime. Uh, define how you're going to manage and measure your availability solution. Again, metrics will help your decision makers to find out if you're being successful or not and determine where you need more money put. Your existing networks can be retrofitted, but it does cost more money to integrate these things in Afterwards, it's a lot cheaper to do it all up front in the initial design. We talked earlier about content caching and content engines. Again, that's an, another way of us doing things to give us some redundancy because if we have a branch office as we have here in this picture, if I don't have to go back to the home office, to the headquarters, to that server every time, and I can get the information off the content engine, that provides me a level of redundancy. Okay? It also gives me a lot more bandwidth speed and alleviates that WAN link burden. But again, it does give you some more availability and more uh, reliability as well. Load balancing and content switching. We talked about this before as well. If we have multiple servers or multiple uh, machines doing the same function, such as in a server farm, we want to distribute that load across all of those extra machines. That's going to give us redundancy because we're not only having one machine. So if one of those five went down right now, we might see a little slowdown in our traffic, but we're still going to be able to service all the traffic. If we only had one machine that did it all and that machine went down, we would be out of luck. So having additional machines gives us more redundancy. So load balancing and content switching is another way to give you more redundancy. And that is our high availability networks.